Hey everybody, this is Craig Garber. Welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar. We've got a really cool guest with us today. We've got Jason Ringenberg with us from Jason and the Scorchers. He's a super interesting guy. He's had a very interesting and long career subsequent to uh, Jason and the Scorchers. And he's uh, just, a, you, you come across like an intellect. I don't know if you know that. <laughs> he's an intellect he's an intellectual guy we're going to use a lot of sat words here uh, a couple of quick announcements uh, i want to thank our mutual friend warner e hodges for connecting us thanks warner uh, also make sure you go to everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash subscribe and uh, subscribe to the show if you're watching us on youtube please uh, hit the subscribe button and the little emoji icon that looks like a bell that really helps us out with the youtube algorithms all righty give you a quick background on jason born and raised on an illinois hog farm left for nashville in 1981 to pursue his dream of i quote making a band that could kick american roots music into the modern age little did he know just how far that kick would go and what he would actually do he immediately formed Jason and the Scorchers and never looked back. Throughout the 80s and 90s, the band tore up venues across the planet and became known as one of the most exciting live bands of their era, releasing 13 albums. Rolling Stone said they single-handedly rewrote the history of rock and roll in the South. Very true. Combining traditional country music with high-energy punk rock. In 2008, they were awarded the Americana Music Association Lifetime Achievement Award for Performance. Jason's also had success as a solo artist, releasing five solo records and touring. In 2002, he created a children's music character called Farmer Jason, winning numerous awards, including an Emmy for his PBS video program, It's a Farmer Jason. Uh, his latest album is Stand Tall. It was written while participating, his solo album, that is. It was written while he was participating in the Artist in Residence program for the National Park Service at Sequoia National Park. And Jason lives about an hour outside of Nashville with his wife and three daughters. Three daughters, God bless you, man. That's, he <laughs> might've been. Boring. That's for sure. <laughs> Life's never, I got one out of three and she's the, the, the destruction of the, the whole family. Uh, man, thank you so much for your time. I so much appreciate you coming on the show. My pleasure, Craig, glad to be here. Uh, you grew up on what was a multi-generational hog form in what I got to assume is a very rural area. I was curious how that, you know, farming is such a, it's not a job, man. It's like music. It's a freaking lifestyle. You wake up and you live it. And I was curious how that influenced you both as a person and a musician and as a musician, if it did influence you even as a musician. Well, I think it has the most profound influence on me. I, I can't think of anything else that would, influencing me more than my upbringing and yeah you're right you know farming was is and always will be it's a passion it's a life it's not a job so i think that rubbed off on me you know watching dad you know it's hard work man raising hogs the old-fashioned way I and mean, we didn't have like a confinement system it was all done what we would call free range now um and it was hard work but Dad never complained. He always enjoyed it, and it never seemed like he had to force himself to do the work. And I think that's rubbed off on me. I, I, I love playing music, and I love everything about the music, even the music business I like. You know, I, I, like, I like all of it. I, I think that Dad's impression sort of affected that. I would imagine your work ethic, was, I mean, you know, if I'm looking at hiring somebody, I want someone who works for a family business or like a, someone who grew up on a farm, which is a family business. You have to have a great work ethic to, to, to make ends meet even there, I would, I would say, no? Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, I would, if I was an employer, I would always, and I've heard it said over and over again in my life that, you know, employers, they look at that, you know, and they see, oh, you, you grew up on a farm. They're more apt to hire you. And they should because... I've seen it in my life, you know, farm boys and, and, and girls normally, not always, but normally they, they have a work ethic that's, that's different than other folks. Uh, you know, we were eight or nine years old and, and we'd be out running tractors and yeah. working all day and baling hay and doing hard, dangerous, important work. You know, that doesn't happen with most nine-year-olds. It just doesn't. No, it doesn't. But man, what a great, I always say, I've got three kids too, and I always say, if you're going to make a mistake parenting, make the mistake of being too tough <laughs> than too soft. Seriously, because like right. you get life skills 
the, you, at least your kids get life skills. And imagine the life skills you got from growing up in a situation like that, man. That's pretty cool, I think, for sure, man. It was. You know, it, I always – and we – the farm still exists, actually, in our family. My mom lives on it. She's 90 years old. You know, we cash rent the ground out. But That's um, cool. You know, it's still, it's still in our family. It's an amazing thing. That's awesome, man. Congratulations on that. You bet. So what were you, you decided to go to Nashville. What were you doing – before you moved to Nashville musically, and then once you got to Nashville, what'd you do to get work? Uh, I went to college in Illinois, and uh, the last college where I graduated from was Southern Illinois University in Carbondale, Illinois. And Southern Illinois was way different than where I grew up in the North. It was really Appalachian. It was very Southern, actually. Mm. And it wasn't that far from Nashville. I mean, Nashville was, you know, a lot of the you know, a lot of the music students actually went to Nashville for day trips and things and for, for learning experiences at, at the college, uh, yeah, at the college. So Nashville was really on my radar. And when I graduated in this, in the, uh, winter of 1980, I stayed in Carbondale for five or six months and, and really got serious about playing bands. And, and cause I wasn't in college anymore. I was just working a job. I was working for the state, for the Department of Conservation. And um, so I was able to, to play music pretty heavy. There was a lot of good music scene in Southern Illinois. And, um, but after six months, I knew I had to make a move. I'd gone as far as I could with it. So Nashville was just the obvious choice. It was, I thought about Austin. I thought about, you know, Los Angeles. I thought about New York. I actually even thought about London. A lot oh. of rockabilly bands were sort of breaking out of London at the time. And yeah. I, was, I thought about that. But Nashville, it was just... That's what I decided to do. And so July 4th of 1981, I moved to Nashville. And so when you get to Nashville, um, did you know anybody? I didn't know so. And in fact, the first time I was there, I'd never been to Nashville before until I moved there. I moved there July 4th of 1981. I didn't have an apartment. I didn't know anything. I literally knew nothing. And as, you know, I guess, you know, God was looking out for me. Um, I got an apartment right behind just... All, all accidental. I got a, an apartment right behind the only rock and roll slash punk rock club, more a bar really, in Nashville. It was playing original music bands. It was Amazing. called Cantrells. I was literally, I could open my window and hear the music coming out of Cantrells. So right off the bat, you know, I was, the Nashville scene was overwhelmingly country pop at that time. You know, it was, it was the days of Lee Greenwood and, and Barbara Mandrell. But there was this real small, little, tiny rock and roll, punk rock, original music crowd. And they all coalesced around Cantrell's, and there I was. So right off the bat, I was able to meet, you know, the only folks that were really doing that sort of thing in Nashville. And that's where it started for me. That is so, uh, have you found throughout the course of your life that, like, when things are meant to be, things like, like, that happen like when you're when that's meant to be you get an apartment behind Cantrell's you know what I'm like have you found the things that like things work organically when they're meant to be as opposed to having to really kill yourself to make them happen not that you don't have to do hard work but you know what I'm saying yeah I think so you know as you say hard work is, is important you know it's all important but there has to be some help <laughs> you know yeah there has to be you know, you have to be doing God's will and you have to be doing your, your purpose on this earth or you will fight it and you probably won't be successful. Yeah. I have found that as I've gotten older and been more aware of it, that when I'm, when I'm less willful and more like, you know, well, let me see how this goes. Let me pursue something I'm interested in. It'll work or it won't, but I don't have to fight it. And that's a better feeling actually. It is. You're right. Greg. Yeah. I agree. Okay. So you're living behind Cantrell's, uh, I, this is going to be the only question I've asked you that you've heard a hundred times. I apologize. But for the listeners who don't know, take them through the story of you meet all the guys and then we'll go from there. You meet all the guys. Yeah, it's, that a, form the score it's an interesting story that a lot of folks don't know is that there actually was a Jason in the national scorchers before Warner, Jeff and Perry. Um, oh. Jack Emerson was one of the first people I met in that scene. And, uh, Jack became like an Americana business legend. He ended up doing E Squared with Steve Earle and managed John Hyatt and, and the Georgia Satellites, all kinds of people. Uh, but in those days, Jack was a Vanderbilt college student. 
and played a little bass. I mean, a tiny, tiny bit of bass. And when I told him what I was planning on doing and what I wanted to do, Jack was the first person that got it. You know, people kind of usually looked at me like I was crazy. Some people laughed in my face. Really? Um, yeah. Like it was like, I want to be country music and I want to be Johnny Rockin' at the same time, you know, and they would laugh at me. Um, so Jack didn't laugh. He said, cool. What can I do to help? <laughs> so Jack, you know, he has some connections with the national, with the Vanderbilt, uh, concert committee. I believe he was on the board or something uh, as a student. And, um, he said, I think I can get you a gig. We have Carl Perkins coming in a few weeks. If we can get a band together, I think we can get a gig opening for Carl Perkins. <laughs> so, and, so I said, sure. And, you know, Jack had a couple of other buddies that kind of played a little bit. Um, so we had this little band, Jason and the National Scorchers. We opened for Carl Perkins. First gig. That ain't you know, a bad first and we gig. we were horrible. We were awful. You know, you can imagine. They weren't even musicians. I mean, a singer was playing drums. You know, Jack didn't even really play bass. The guitar player, Will Tomlinson, was a pretty good guitar player, but he was a law student. He was, he was studying to be a lawyer, you know. Um, and we were horrid. We were awful. But Jeff Johnson was at that show. <laughs> Jeff was real tuned in. And Jeff was like, afterwards, you know, they ran into McCann Trails a day or two later. And he said, man, I saw that show and it was crazy. and I loved it. And I kind of want in on this. You know, your band isn't good enough. We need to get a better band. I want to help. So that's what started. Jeff then brought in Warner. Uh, Warner brought in Perry. And this all happened in a matter of just months. Uh, I came to town July 4th, 81. We were actually selling out. Uh, clubs in Nashville by January of 1982 and we got a record out wow. so it happened really fast really fast man talk about ominous you know like things meant to be that's pretty freaking quick that's awesome really really cool yeah with that I mean a lot of folks don't realize that but Jeff was a you know when people look at Jason the Squadrons they usually think oh Warner and Jason and it's kind of like Keith and Mick but yeah you know Jeff played a huge role in the early days had I not met Jeff it's hard to say what might have not have happened you know yeah he was very, very important. That's cool, man. Thank you. Uh, as far as getting the band launched and, and working on this thing, this sound, this, uh, this country punk, what were some of the big challenges for you guys early on? Well, most of it was logistics because we had no money and there was no pockets around the band. You know, there was no rich parents or 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 trust funds or <laughs> anything like that so it was all you know if we had a if our van broke down you know in the middle of mississippi we might not be able to make it period <laughs> yeah. you, know? Uh, you know we might have been stuck and you know but there was also there we, we i guess we had an army of guardian angels watching over us it was crazy we we would do overnight drives and 700 mile drives after doing shows and somehow never got in wrecks and we never, we never broke down when there wasn't somebody there to help us. It was amazing because our van was ancient. It was my old Econoline van from, from college. It, you know, had 200,000 miles on it. It was 71 Econoline. Uh, there was holes in the floor. You could actually see the, you could see the, uh, the road through the floor. Um, so the amps didn't work often. Uh, there was a lot of substance abuse in the band, <laughs> you know, um, there was fighting, arguing, uh, good times, bad times. It's amazing that we survived those first two years. And I take a lot of credit for it. Uh, it was a band and without all four members, there wouldn't have been, there wouldn't have been Jason, the history of Jason and the Scorchers. But early on me expect, and, 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 and Jeff, especially, we realized that there was something there that there was something really cool there. So we were able to sort of skate over the real rough patches and keep the band together. Around 83 or so, Warner sort of started really getting it, and then he, he really committed to it, and that changed things substantially. Um, Perry just was always, he was like the Ringo star of the band. He was so important, but, you know, he wasn't thinking in the early days that, oh, I'm going to be famous for this, <laughs> you know. He just said, you know, hey, I want to make more than $35 a week. That's what I make at the bowling alley. If you guys can make me $35 a week, you know, I'll play drums for you. And that's that's what it was. <laughs> yeah. I believe amazing. we actually signed a little stupid contract, like on a mat napkin or piece of paper saying, 
me, Warner, and Jeff would guarantee Perry would make $35 a week. Um, and we, we made it. We, we usually did make it. That's great, man. Thank you. That's a really cool story. Um, so I'm going to jump forward because the rest of this has been covered a million times. And I don't want to put you through that. Once the Scorchers broke up, did you know right away that you were going to start a solo career or did you like, cause that's like a major thing or did you take some time to decompress and say, Hey, what am I going to do now? Or like, how did, what, what was the thought process for you at that point? I jumped right in. Um, and I had a lot of, a lot of connections and a lot of people, of course, a lot of people knew about the band. So, um, I decided to sort of go country, <laughs> you know, um, looking back, it was a silly idea. There was no way country music was ever going to accept Jason Ringenberg. It was never going to happen, but I gave it my best. I tried, but I jumped right into it. The Scorpions broke up in November of 90, November of 89. And by I think February or March of eight of 90, you know, I was starting to talk to Capitol Records. I had a development deal with them and was starting to work on a new record. That's, that's it. So how did, how did you know how to, that you wanted to do that right away? Or is that, are you just that kind of guy? Like you're not sitting still very long. Oh yeah. I, I just can't, yeah. I, I, I had to work and move and keep yeah. making music. And that was just, that's just me. That's all yeah. I was saying. No, I get that. I'm like, I, it's almost like you'd rather make a bad decision and do something because something good will come out of it than to just sit and wait. I, that's paralyzing. I, I get that, man. Yeah, I, th I think I think you're right, Craig. It's it's um, you know, my motto has always been, you know, do something even if it's wrong. <laughs> you know, you got to do something. Yeah. What's the downside? I mean, the big picture of life, you know, there's not what is really the downside of failing at something. For the most part, nothing severe. You right. know, really, man. I agree. Um, what was the biggest adjustment between being a solo artist and being such a dynamic band leader fronting a, a band as wild as the Scorchers? What was the biggest adjustment for you? I don't think I ever made the adjustment. Um, the solo, the first solo run, which w w was the Capitol record in 90, which came out in 91, I think, uh, or 92. Um, it didn't work at all. And, you know, I had a, a pretty good band. I had a crack band. I mean, my band, it was uh, just to tell my band, we had Ken Coomer on drums. who went on to, you know, to, to be in Wilco, to be the drummer for Wilco and all those records. And, and um, I had Dave Jakes on bass who ended up being, you know, John Prine's bassist. Brad Jones who became a great producer was also played bass with us. Uh, Jerry Dale McFadden, who's now with the Mavericks was, on on keyboards so i had a crack band man it was <laughs> it was an awesome band but going from jason and the scorchers to an awesome band still is not good enough <laughs> you know yeah. and, and i knew it i i knew we weren't i knew the record wasn't really good enough to make an impression and it really didn't it, it did it did fail uh ultimately and i went back right, right back right back into jason and the scorchers you know i, I that's what that's what happened yeah. Uh, it's interesting. Uh, relations dynamics. That's a, that's the voodoo of a band, you know, the, the, di you know, you didn't have that same, you had great guys, but it wasn't the same, you know, thing that you, as you had with, with Jason and the Scorchers. It's hard to replicate that it, like in any relationship, you know? Yeah. Jason and the Scorchers is, impossible to replicate um even with me and warner uh, as still in the band it's still really difficult to match what we did with the 80s but we can now some but to not have jason and the scorchers it it always is something i miss if i don't have that i don't miss it if i'm solo if i'm performing solo with my acoustic guitar and telling stories and and doing that that whole thing, it's a whole different thing. It's so different that it works. Right. But when I use a band, I mean, golly, sometimes I'll have bands with three guitar players in them and they still can't really match what Warner Hodges did with one person. Uh, <laughs> you know, Warner is just, you, you really just can't, you, you really can't replace Warner Hodges. It's, I don't think it's possible. No. And he's so deliberate in his playing. I mean, he's aware of so much that he has to do. That's, 
that's a real gift, man. Yeah, I, I love him with the Scorchers the best. He does all kinds of stuff now, but with the Scorchers, he he doesn't have anything to fall back on. <laughs> <You know? laughs> there's there's nothing. I, I play a little acoustic sometimes, you know, a quarter of the time, a little acoustic, which right. hardly is even hurt. So he's covering everything. Yeah. And he's also doing harmony vocals. He's also kind of the band leader and, and you know, responsible for the stage, you know, the stage output. So, you know, it really challenges him to, to do that. And I, it's really exciting to watch him pull it off on a very regular basis, night after night, yeah. you know, all alone up there, really, you know, holding the whole melody and the whole sort of instrumental uh, interest for the audience is, is all Warner Hodges. You know, our rhythm sections are, are brilliant. Don't get me wrong. Sure. Honest and Al and before that, Jeff and, and, and Perry. But Warner always was the sort of the, the counter melody to, to the Jason melody. He, he was exclusively that. So it's f fascinating to watch him pull it off mm. and pull down the rhythm guitar and hold down the lead guitar and hold down the riffs. It's really quite astounding. Yeah, and you don't miss it when he when he goes off on a solo with no rhythm. You would think, oh well, it's, it's gonna, there's going to be an energy diminishment, of course, but there's not <laughs> with one. No, yeah. there's not. Um, tell me about Farmer Jason and what I was curious about. What gave you the idea to develop that character and that act, and talk about a different audience? How did you, it probably wasn't, how did you learn, like, how did you go about learning what that audience wanted? Because that's not, I mean, I don't think that's something you had done before. No, I had never done, and I never really even thought about it until I started raising my second family. Um, and it was, as you say, such a learning experience because I wasn't a young guy, you know. I started that, I don't know, 43 or 4 maybe. Um, so, I already was, you know, I was set in my ways musically. And, and all of a sudden, as you say, I was in front of a completely different audience doing a completely different musical entity. Because the, the solo Jason, there were some similarities to the Scorchers Jason. Uh, for one, I played the songs, Sino you know, solo, I played Broken Whiskey Less solo, and, you know, things like that. There's connections. With Farmer Jason, it was completely different. I learned, I swear, the, for the first three years, I learned something every single show I did. It was, it was so exciting to, to be aware. You know, I, was, I wasn't a kid anymore. I was a smart, experienced, you know, middle-aged man doing something brand new. So it was so cool to, to like, learn this whole new approach to music. I, I loved it. It was, it was just fantastic. And you have kind of two customers there because you have the kids, but the parents are the customers as well. Yeah. In the early part of Farmer Jason, I was playing to a lot of uh, parents of, of, that were Scorcher fans or solo fans. So there was a real, real cool chemistry there. Yeah. Um, as it went on, though, there was a brand new audience that didn't really know who the Scorchers were or anything of that. They were a whole different group of people. So you know, they would, they would trust their kids to me. And for an hour, they could just let Jason, Farmer Jason, worry about their kids. <laughs> yeah. you know? They could like sit down, have a sandwich at the back, you know, have a drink maybe, and, um, you know, and relax because Farmer Jason was entertaining their kids and everything's cool. Um, so it was really interesting that, that dynamic that all those parents were trusting me with their children, you know, yeah. and, even not at shows, you know, when I, they put on their, my CDs or my, my, my videos, you know, they were, they were trusting me to do something good for their kids. Right. Giving them, giving them a break. And that was a profound responsibility. You know, it was heavy stuff, you know. What, what made you get into that? What would, like, what was the, how, how did you think of that? That's not something that, like, you're like a pretty dynamic front man of a pretty dynamic band. And now you're going to, you're switching into, to entertaining children. How did, like, how did you think of that? Well, I started a second family in 98. Uh, Addie and Camille, they loved music as, as kids. 
And we had a few like children's CDs. Uh, they were heavy into Rafi, they were heavy into Tara Time. Um, and they could listen to those records all day, the same ones, sometimes the same song. Um, so I was thinking, my goodness, you know, Tara, uh, like, you know, from Tara Time was part of her family. <laughs> She was she was there all the time, you know. Vacations. Right. There was Tara, you know, playing on the DVD in our car DVD player, and you know, there we were, you know, playing her music when they were putting them to bed, you know, putting the kids to bed. So it was just the coolest thing for me to think about. Wow, I should do this. This, <laughs> this. Yeah, I want in on this. I want to do this. And plus, you know, I was touring all the time in those days, and I thought, you know, if I make, well, you know, some music that my own kids can listen to of me, you know, that they would have a piece of dad when I wasn't around. Yeah. So those two things were the reasons. Um, right off the bat, I, I didn't think it was going to be a career thing, but fast it became that. It was, it, it, it immediately hit. There was, there was no, there was no resistance to it. It was a good idea and people loved it right from the start. Uh, you know, it was, it was an immediate, immediate hit. How do you go booking gigs for that now? It's not like you call up a booking agent and say, hey, I'm, get me in here in Tucson or wherever. How do you book gigs for something like that? In the early days of, the, of Farmer Jason, what we would do is, because I was doing the solo thing pretty heavy, I, I had a, a kind of a mini run, 2001, two, three, and four, and five. You know, made three or four pretty interesting records and did a lot of touring, especially in Europe. So I had a base and I had a system. So uh my agent for jason ringenberg would just say look you're already we already have you there set up in this club you know september 26th 2003 uh mr club person why don't you put a daytime show on for kids they almost always wanted to do it it was such a cool thing to do you know to have their you know grungy rock and roll club turned into a place for kids. A lot of them had their, a lot of the, the, the club people, you know, uh, ladies or, or, you know, mothers or fathers had kids. Yeah, yeah. You know? So they would, yeah, you know, yeah, little Bobby, you know, you're going to go where, you know, where mommy owns a club and you're going to hang out and enjoy some music. So it was easy to do. Oh, that's um, As it grew then, though, it, it became a whole different world. I, I became, you know, I was doing performing arts centers as Farmer Jason. Yeah. And, you know, that was a whole different, it became a legitimate thing all by itself. Um, in the, in the last days of it, say 2010 to 2015, you know, all I was doing is farmer Jason. That was what I was doing. And, you know, playing nice rooms, you know, beautiful dressing rooms and catered dinners and, <laughs> you know, you know, spotlights and, and, you know, filled up, you know, theaters. It was a wonderful experience. That's cool, man. And so you're you're probably like a bit of a superhero to your girls as they were when you were doing the Farmer Jason thing. Yeah, they would play on their records. Their kids were fans, you know. They'd come to the shows and they'd perform on stage with me. And you know, it was, and to this day, a lot of those kids still remember their friends, you know. And they'll come over to visit. You know, my kids now are like twenty, and uh, my oldest is thirty, and then Addie and Camille are are, are uh, twenty-two and twenty. And their friends are adults. Right. Well, yeah, remember when we used to do the doggy dance <laughs> with, with your dad? <laughs> you know, let's do the doggy dance again. Put on the doggy dance. And let's, That's let's funny, man. Five. Hey, man, it's all about making memories with kids, man. That's, that's cool. Go. Hey, I want to, uh, your new record, I really, I really liked it. Let me pull it up here, man. Stand Tall. And uh, I just wanted to ask you, you have a good band on that record, man. Yeah, it was a, a whole collection of people. It was a, I did like my own version of the last waltz. <laughs> you know, Good band. Even that, like, there was incredible people on that record. And um, it, the whole backstory of that is it's a fascinating story. really. Yeah. So. T talk about it. Cause I want to ask you some questions about it. Tell me about it. Well, uh, 16, 17 things have sort of died for me. Um, the farmer Jason audience had, had aged out, uh, the people that were supporting it financially weren't really there anymore. And um, there wasn't a Jason Ringenberg thing anymore. I'd sort of let that go. Uh, Jason and the Scorpers weren't making music. So 
you know, I was like just working jobs and stuff. And, and I thought, I thought my run was done really. Yeah. You know, I thought it was over and I, I wasn't bitter, you know, it was just, Hey, you know, <laughs> had a good run, you know, I'm yeah, yeah. but out of the blue, uh, someone from the United States forestry department called me up, uh, you know, uh, the national park service and they were sort of into farmer Jason and thought that I would be a good artisan residence at, at one of their parks because they were starting to get away from the part the artisan residents just being painters and photographers. They were, they wanted to do performing artists. And so that they just thought, wow, farmer Jason, perfect. So they called me up out of the blue, a telephone call out of the blue. And I thought it was a joke. I thought it was one of my friends playing a trick. I mean, this sounded too good to be true. So it wasn't. And they said, we want you to go to Sequoia national park, Kings Canyon and live there for a month and write songs and do some shows. I was like, well, what's the catch? I thought, well, do you want me to like write songs about the Sequoias and then give them to give the songs to you and then say goodbye and whatever. That'd be great. I'm sure. You know, I'm in. Um, they said, no, we want you just to write songs about anything you want to write about. And you'll still own the songs. You can make records out of those songs if you want to. Uh, we want you to talk about your experience in the press. We want you to do some shows in the park as Farmer Jason and as Jason Ringenberg. Well, wow, you know, <laughs> yeah. I could see <laughs> yeah, why you were like, what's the like catch? Three and a half seconds to say yes to that. Yeah. So I did it in June 17. I went out there. It was uh, early June. In the Sierra Nevada mountains, it was still snowing. <laughs> you know, it was, it was still like it was still late winter. You know, it was fantastic. I was in a cabin, and when I say cabin, I use that word very loosely. No, you're not. This isn't jacuzzi cabin. This isn't internet and m microwave and you know uh, king size beds cabin. This was a cabin. There wasn't power for most of the day. There wasn't oh. running water a lot of the times. Um, never internet, forget that. <laughs> you know, so you had no internet, internet you know, for a month. Cell phone, yeah, no way. You know, that was if you're, you know, if a bear is attacking you, you're dead. <laughs> you know, wow. you can't fight that bear off. <laughs> you know, it was fantastic, fantastic. So yeah, I spent a, a, a month there, and uh, my cabin was at like eighty five hundred feet, nine thousand feet. That's I cool. could walk out the cabin and be in the Sierra Nevada mountains just in a matter of minutes, you know, these beautiful trails. Uh, and the section of the park I was in was pretty isolated. You know, all national parks are heavily visited now. They should be, of course. But I was in a part of the park that was kind of a, a new area of the park. They just annexed it, and it wasn't really – people weren't hip to it. It took like an hour just to drive up to my cabin. Um, so a lot of times I would hike all day and not see a soul, another human being. Um, and – songs just poured out you know i was like God. you know i just I, I couldn't not write i was writing just like crazy um and in that month period i wrote i basically wrote two records and you know both sam tall and the record i'm making now the foundation of those records were, were written were written you know that's Sequoia national park kings canyon that's where it was where is that, that in california it is Severa Nevada Mountains in Northern California. God, that must have been uh, beautiful. Yeah, you know, uh, it was one of Muir's favorite, John Muir's favorite places. Uh, you know, he's famous for Yosemite, of course, but you know, he loved he loved the, that area. It wasn't a park when he was visiting there, but he was real instrumental in, in becoming a park, a national park. He loved Crescent Meadow, for example, where I wrote. Uh, uh, John Muir stood here. I wrote one of the songs on the new record that I'm doing. Um, that day I wrote, uh, God bless the Ramones. Or, so I wrote three songs in that one day. That's um, pretty cool. Two of them standing where John Muir stood at the Crescent Meadow. Um, it was just, <laughs> you know, I'll never forget it. For a while, my kids came out and joined me and they were like, wow dad you really scored this time <laughs> you know <laughs> they really they had never been west you know and uh you know we had always gone family vacations disneyland disney world all that stuff you know uh, but this was this was totally different it was like yeah. okay we get why 
you're an outdoors person, Dad. We get this now. We get why you want to go hiking in the mountains. Now we get it. <laughs> well, they're, they're really, older, too. They're older. They're which, older. Yeah. yeah they, they were 20 and 18 at that time. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it was, you know, Sequoia is an amazing place. It's, it's uh, to be around trees that are 2,000 years old. You know, I'm not going to get all cosmic here, but, you know, man. Yeah, that's pretty you know, intense. We're nothing compared to that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we're nothing compared to that kind of beauty and that kind of power. Yeah. And that kind of spirit. You know, you're going to tell me they don't have a soul? Bullshit. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I know you, I had never been out west and we went to uh, uh, Oregon and, you know, the parks out there and we drove to Seattle. And, you know, here in Florida, man, everything's flat, as you know. It was, I had never, it was literally breathtaking. So I understand, you know, it, it's overwhelming. It's amazing to see, like, you know, how beautiful that stuff is, man. What, uh, what areas did you see when you were in Oregon and Washington? Uh, we, we, went, we actually drove from Boise to Seattle. And then we also, uh, before we were in Boise, we went to... Um, embarrassed the park there uh not yosemite what's the other what's the park it's in wyoming yellowstone yes yellowstone national park so we we right. drove all around the park and camped in there for a few for like a week wow what uh what can you remember your campground i know yellowstone as well i don't man sorry i'm from the bronx this whole thing is kind of like just <laughs> it's not stuff i inherit like i could tell you what happened on 48th street in new york city but i i, I like to to refine that with not it's not inherent in me you know what uh how did you camp tent camping or did you use a camper or how did you camp cabin we no no we didn't go <laughs> we we my buddies parents had a cabin there it wasn't like a fancy cabin at all it was you know no internet same thing you know no internet but it was just being in that area i'd never seen anything like that in my life man what season were you there at yellowstone same summertime so so it was like early june type thing uh no it was actually august but you know what we went uh we went fishing in some lake in idaho and man, there was snow all over the mountains in August. <laughs> in August, right? Yeah, right. it was. We were freezing. We all had winter jackets on. We were on the boat freezing. <laughs> I mean, it, it it's a trip. But yeah, man, the the it was so majestic. I totally get what you, the vibe there. It's it's like hollow, like sacred ground, man. When you're around that stuff, it is. Yeah, no, no doubt. So you went to Boise to Washington. You went through the Bitterroot Mountains, then. Uh, the home of the old Nez, Nez Perce, uh, Native Americans. Uh. Yeah, in fact, in uh, we pulled over one time because there was like a Native American, uh, like a fair, like a little local fair. And so we just went out and walked around and saw a lot of the Native American artwork. And it was just like a, any local fair, except it was mostly Native Americans, you know. Um, it was it was you know, and they were selling, uh, like here they'd be selling, you know, some canvas painting there. They're selling, uh, a deer skin coat or something, you know, right. they, you know, or, uh, uh, skeleton from some animal that's been, you know, polished and, you know, you could put on your table or something like that. Cool. So it was just, I understand what you're saying though, man. That's really, really beautiful area. It wasn't a really, you had to be so relaxed writing all that music. Yeah, you know, I don't think I, you know, I was able to leave the world behind, you know, for a month. At our age, as you know, it's hard to do that. Yeah. You know, um, but yeah, I was able to do that. Uh, one experience I'll never forget was I did a, a trail up in the Sierra uh, near my cabin. And I was going up a mountain and I just went up and back. Uh, and coming back, I saw my tracks. It was a snow, snowy day. So I wanted to make sure I followed my way back and I didn't get lost, um, which could happen easily. So I was following my own tracks back. And at one point I realized, <laughs> I looked down and there, was a, there had been a bear following my, me. 
there had been a bear following me. I could see the tracks of the bear. <laughs> oh my <laughs> God. Yeah. Right. Right. So, wow. you know, I was, I wasn't at the top of the food chain for a little while there. Um, yeah. <laughs> wow. It's good that you saw that on the way back and not like, <laughs> I, I mean, what, that, what would you have done? Uh, you know, you, they, they give you sort of, they tell you to stand up really tall and look big. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't know. Okay, I, man. I probably just run knowing that they're going to catch me anyway. The bear's going to catch me, but I'm just not going to think I can scare this bear. Yeah. You know, I, I you know, uh, you know. <laughs> wow, that's really cool. Man. To get eaten by a bear, that's just the way it goes. <laughs> uh, what? Just a silly question, but what was like your sleeping patterns? Well, you know, it was all based on power because there was no power at night in the cabin. So, you know, Wait I a would, minute. So you must have been freezing. It was really cold at night. Yeah, it was really cold. Um, really cold. I had just piles and piles of clothes on me. Um, but I had a little uh, kerosene lantern, you know, I could read. Okay. So, uh, you know, I was reading one, one of those, that great Peter Cooper book uh, about different musicians that he's known. I read that during that time and, um, you know, read some Carl Sandburg and uh, it was, uh, so I just read at dark, you know, and then just fall asleep and then wake up really early and go, you know, yeah. wow. I, I never, I never, never, I never wasn't outside during that time. I was always doing something. That's so cool, man. You got to re up for that. How do we get, let's put this out in the universe. We need them to re up for that. We need another around too. Yeah. Yeah. It's an amazing thing. You know, they, you know, I'm not exactly sure how it happened, but yeah, I'll never forget it. I know that. Yeah. That's awesome. Hey, let me talk to you. Let me ask you some questions about some of the songs on stand tall. Um, I just got it. This one, like who writes a song with this title? This is hilarious. John the Baptist was a real humdinger. <laughs> that might be the single greatest song title I've ever heard. What's the backstory for that one? What prompted the thought process? I don't remember precisely when it was at Sequoia, but that was one of the Sequoia songs. And I think it's been in the wilderness because, you know, the Baptist was a wilderness guy and he was, I had been thinking what a fascinating character he, he was. Uh, my, my, probably my favorite New Testament character was John the Baptist because uh, he was a hippie, you know. He was a radical revolutionary. He was, uh, the authorities hated him, you know. <laughs> they, you know, and he hated the authorities, you know. Um, he was anti-authoritarian. He was, you know, a radical. And he had no ego. So I was thinking all those things. I'm, I'm not sure why. I was thinking about John the Baptist uh, at that period of my life, but being in the wilderness and just thinking that, you know, he lived in the wilderness. That's what he did. And people thought he was crazy. They thought he was nuts because he lived out, you know, he ate bugs and, you know, and wild honey and, you know, or, or, you know, camel first. Um, he wasn't a religious authority. And here he was telling people to repent and to prepare for, for the, for the coming of the Christ. So uh, it was just so fascinating to me, this, this, this John the Baptist. So when I was out there in the wilderness and making my own tracks and, and all the solitude, it was just like, yeah, John the Baptist was so cool. And then I, I couldn't just say John the Baptist was cool. I mean, that's too easy. Uh, yeah. So I wanted, to, I wanted to put him in, you know, I wanted to be able to sing this song to a Todd Snyder audience, you know. I wanted to open for Todd Snyder and sing this song and, and they get it, you know? So I, I, that's the line I took writing this song. You know, it was like, yeah, I want somebody that's going to go to a Bernie Sanders rally to really like this song. You know, <laughs> um, that's, that's what I'm going for here. You know, I want somebody with long hair and, and, you know, is for legalized marijuana. And, you know, I, you know, I want them and then I want my cousin who's a born again Christian to like this song. That was right. my goal with this song. That's what I'm a goal. And I think I pulled it off. Man, I, I think, think you I did. No, I've, I've had, you know, very fundamental uh, Christian folks say they love the song. And I've had, you know, crazy hippies that, you know, <laughs> that 
that would never step inside a church say they love John the Baptist was a real humdinger. I think I succeeded and I'm enormously proud of it. Yeah, man. It's a very good song. I, what, uh, real cre- I mean, it's just the amount of creativity it takes to tie something like that all together is, you know, pretty cool. I think, you know, not, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. God bless the Ramones. That's a cool song, man. What made you write that? I, oh, I love it's like such a great story, the whole song. Yeah, it's a real story. Every bit of it's true. Um, I was at Sequoia and I was underneath the Charles Young tree, the Colonel Charles Young tree. The, the big trees at Sequoia are all named after mostly uh, Gilded Age, late 19th century American presidents or Civil War generals on the Union side. Okay. Um, because that's just what people did in those days. So, you know, the biggest tree in the world is the General Sherman tree, who could care less about the environment. <laughs> you know, had nothing to do with starting these national parks. He was just the greatest of the war general. So they named the biggest tree in the world after General Sherman. Uh, the Grant tree is the second biggest tree in the world. Um, you know, Grant had nothing to do with, with, with the environmental movement. He wasn't anti it, but he wasn't really for it the way the later the way Teddy Roosevelt, for example, was um, as the president. Then there were Civil War generals they named after uh, these trees. There's one tree, though, that was named after a very late 19th century American officer named Colonel Charles Young. Now, at first I thought he must have been, I don't know, a Spanish-American war hero or something, or I, I didn't know. Uh, I'd never heard of him. I'm a history guy, but never heard of Colonel Young. It turns out, as I started reading a book about Colonel Young, that he was uh, the first African-American to be commissioned a colonel by the United States Army in the 1880s. And this was a radical thing in those days. It, 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 shook, it shook our country up. I mean, there was a lot of people that were absolutely against the idea of a black man commanding white troops as a colonel, as a head of a regiment. So, but he was so successful, he was so brave, he was such a great officer that he gained the respect of all the white soldiers that served under him, you know, the, the African-Americans that served under him. Uh, and he was, you know, went on to do other stuff besides being that first. He was the first African-American to graduate from West Point, which was, oh, wow. which was you know, almost impossible. Yeah, you know, they did everything they could to make it so he couldn't graduate. They, they, they cheated his chest, chest, uh, test scores, you know. Most of the cadets wouldn't even speak to him for four years that he was there. They wouldn't speak to him. They had to sort of pack. They weren't even going to speak to him. And they played all these horrible j- jokes on him and all this stuff. But he graduated with honors. Um, then later in his Army career, he, he should have been a general. He really should have been a general. And uh, had he been white, he would have been a general because he was so brilliant. But he, he probably would have been a brigadier general or even higher than that in the peacetime Army. But – Colonel Young then became the commandant of the Sequoia National Park. <laughs> okay, this was even more radical because all of a sudden, you know, these loggers, when, when Sequoia had become a park, these loggers, you know, these logger barons in the West were used to going in and cutting down these Sequoia trees and making a literal killing. You know, they would, they would earn a fortune cutting down these gigantic trees, a fortune. So they were used to doing it. And it was all quasi-legal. They really didn't have permits, but they had, you know, senators in their pockets and, and representatives, congressmen in their pockets, pockets, and they could do it. And, you know, the local authorities wouldn't try to stop him. All of a sudden, Colonel Young takes over and says, well, if we're going to have a national park called the Sequoia National Park, first thing we got to do is save the Sequoias because they're getting cut down as we, as we stand here. So he would show up, you know, with a few of his soldiers who were terrified. You know, they had to tell these giant, these loggers, these huge gangs of loggers that were all armed to the teeth. You know, they were violent thugs. You know, they weren't responsible forestry people. They were thugs cutting down these trees illegally. And all of a sudden, Colonel Young would show up. And wow, you know. He would stare these guys down, you know, it's just him and a few of his soldiers, you know, against like 30 or 40 of these gangs of, of, of thugs, all armed. And he would just tell them, you know, there's great stories where he would just look them in the eye, stand there, you know, with his feet apart, with his hands on his hips, you know, holding his pistols in each hand, you know, ready to pull them. 
and say, yeah, you know, there's 40 of you and there's one, there's, you know, two or three of us, you know, you're going to win, but you, sir, the foreman, you're going to get a bullet between your eyes before I do. I'm going to get you. You know, he would say things like that, you know, and it would freak these guys out. They were ultimately cowards, as most of those people usually are, yeah. and they would leave. So, Colonel Young saved Sequoia National Park. Here I am standing there thinking, whoa, you know what, you know, this gigantic tree, what am I, my little, you know, in my little world, I need to write a song right now, you know, what am I going to write a song about? So, I just, I couldn't help thinking, you know, my heroes, one of my heroes are the Ramones. Sure. So I thought Ramones, I'm going to write a song about the Ramones. God bless the Ramones, <laughs> you know, God bless them. And once again, I was thinking, wow, what a cool thing to do to say the word God with the Ramones. With the Ramones. The title, you know, that's yeah. cool. And then, okay, what do I say about the Ramones? And then I thought, okay, the Scorchers opened for the Ramones in 1982, a whole tour of Texas. When we were a nobody, we were nothing. You know, somehow he got this tour for, for, for a week, open for the Ramones, the big cities, all of them, Dallas, Houston, Beaumont, Austin, San Antonio. Unheard of, unknown. Our amps barely worked. Our van hardly worked. We had no money. I don't. I think they paid us, you know, $50 a night to do this. One or two of the nights we didn't even get paid. You know, we couldn't find the promoter. Um, and we were opening for the Ramones, you know. And all this tough guy stuff, this band from Queens, you know, and all these rumors that they were, you know, they beat up people and they were tough and they, you know, would be really cruel to opening bands. And, you know, they would, you know, just, you know, they were, they were just these tough guys it was all baloney. They were beautiful people, That's you know. Cool. Dee Ramon was really helpful to us. He gave Jeff some bass strings, you know, because Jeff didn't have bass strings. You know, they let us use their 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 hospitality room because God, we couldn't afford food. You know, we couldn't wow, afford food. Really cool. Bologna and white bread. You know, we, wow, we had chicken wings. You know, and and wow, you know, chips with dip. You know, in the Ramones, you know, hospitality room. It was an amazing experience. God bless the Ramones. That's what the song's about. Man, you know what's so impressive is this is what people don't realize. Look at all that effort and energy you put into writing that song. That's not just the song. This is researching the whole history of Colonel Charles Young. And you can see it's like it's stuff that you're interested in because you were like super enthusiastic about it. And um, then that allowed, you know, that's the series of thoughts that I'm always fascinated about that, man. Like, you know, things don't just happen. Well, good, good point, Craig. And, and anybody who, you know, if you don't like a record, fine. You know, that's, that's your right. You know, as a yeah. fan of music, you can not like a record. But be careful how you don't like it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, because yeah. that artist put a lot of time into that record, man. You know, probably at least a year of his or her life. You know, at least a year, maybe yeah. more. Yeah. And, you know, just kind of be respectful that you may not like it, may not be your cup of tea, it may not be their best record, but they worked really hard. They did the best they could. Yeah. You know? And the same life, you know, most people that have been around for several records and done several tours over, over two or three decades. They care, you know? Yeah. Hell yeah. They may not have the chops they did when they were 20 years old, but they're still trying their best and, and respect that. Yeah, man. Absolutely. Uh, and then I want to talk about the title track stand tall it's a really cool really cool instrumental man it, it made me feel like i was riding a horse through the old west in a cowboy movie i mean that is impossible for me i could not and i listened to it several <laughs> times i was impossible to not get that visual what what that's such a cool tune man what did you you know what made you come up with that well, all my life I've wanted to do that kind of, you know, spaghetti western instrumental. I could yeah. never talk producers into doing it. It can never, it never happened. Tried a lot of times, but this time I was at the helm. <laughs> you know, I, I co-produced "Stand Tall," so, you know, yeah, I, I said we need trumpets. You know, we need chants in the background and subliminal chants, and and we need, you know, fourteen different instruments going on here, and and we need, you know, baritone guitars, and we need Gretsch guitars, and we need you know, we need, you know, a, a opera singer singing 
a verse on it, you know. Uh, the people I was working with at first probably thought I was out of my mind. Um, but it all came together. It was the hardest mix I've ever done in my life. We had so many tracks on it. it was, God bless the, you know, the Michael Lasellius who, who mixed that record. It was, I can't believe he was able to pull that off. Um, but, but he did. And it's a, I, I'm so proud of that song. I spent more time on that song than any song in my career. It's, really? And there's no vocals on it except the, yeah. the opera singer. That, that, the verse where the opera singer, he's a real opera singer. That's a real opera singer that sang that verse. You know, it's, <laughs> it's such a cool Had song. Had I done that, man. it would have sounded completely ridiculous. But <laughs> him doing it, it was, oh, it's so cool. I love it. Love That's it. such a cool song. Yeah, I could see why it would be difficult to make that song to get someone else's okay to make that song but it's a great song and it was really good that you put it in up front that was a really yeah like the, you know it opens the, sh the, the show perfectly you know yeah it, it sets the tone you wonder what's coming next you know what's what's this record about you know well, it's like no, the journey it is a journey yeah it's like the journey and i mean because a lot of times you're tempted you know most of the time you put the title track the last or last so first side last song you know that was a perfect opening for that whole record man really Thank you. yeah man i really dug it um what were some uh so let me just tell people uh check out the new record uh, it's not the new but check check out jason's last record it's called stand tall it's available i guess wherever wherever music streams i guess now right yeah, we're, it's, it's available everywhere. Uh, it's available. And then you could buy it, I, I would assume, directly from your website? You can. JasonRingenberg.com. Okay. You can get on Amazon. You can stream it anywhere. You know, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a pretty successful record for me at my age and a solo record. Oh, it's, um, it's a great record, man. It's really cool. You got I'm, some cool stuff. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy with the way it turned out. It, it was a life-changing experience, the whole, the whole thing. That's cool, man. Um, what were some low points or dark periods you've had to deal with and how'd you get through them? Wow. You know, yeah. <laughs> <A lot of laughs> right. I know who I, you know, I had a guy on the show one time, only one person in like 750 guests. He said, Oh, nothing. Everything's been great. I'm like, it was so ridiculous. I, d I didn't even challenge him because I was like, okay, if you're going to play it like that. Okay, fine. I mean, and he was like 55, no, he's older than me. I was 55 at the time. He's probably 60. Anyway, <laughs> yeah, the um, I would say I'm I'm pretty solid mentally for an artist for a musician. So, but you have to use that caveat for a musician. <laughs> you know, um, we're still crazy. All of us are nuts. We're all crazy. Um, so I've never, you know, I've never had a broke. You know, I've never had a you know a, a, a nervous breakdown, or I've never been in rehab, or luckily never had any addictions. But yeah. Yeah, I've had my dark times. Yeah, sure. Um, there's been several points, especially with the Scorchers, where, I mean, that band was supposed to be the next big thing. I mean, we were touted as the next big thing. We were, we were groomed to be the next big thing. Uh, people spent money on us like we were going to be the next big thing. I mean, our, our deal with Capital was a million-dollar contract. Wow. Um, our deal with A&M was close to that. So... You know, you had these huge expectations with, with Jason and the Scorchers that, that never, we never were a commercial success. It was always a, a cult thing. Um, so, you know, when we have these periodic moments where this is the one that's going to do it, you know, we're going to just, this is the one that's going to, when it's going to happen. And, you know, and then it wouldn't. And it was always, yeah. you know, both one went through that, I went through that different times. Um, but it's always been, it's always been that, that backdrop has always been a backdrop in my career is that I'm not a commercially successful artist, really. Farmerization was the closest I came to commercial success, but that wasn't, you know, I wasn't Rafi or the Wiggles, you know, that's, you know. So I've never had that kind of thing happen. So it's always a, a struggle. You know, you have to make the numbers work. You have to keep your mortgage paid, you know, because, wow, you know, here's a reality a lot of people don't think about. I'm on the road 250 days a year, right? Most of the time through yeah, my good years. That means my wife, Susie, she can't go out and work a 40 hour a week. She can't have a career because somebody's right. got to take care of the kids. You kids can't have them in daycare all the time, yeah. you know, to, you know, all the time. So, you know, those are things 
you know, you have to take into account. And it can, it can be depressing if you, you know, you go out and do a four week tour of Europe and you work your tail off and you come home and wow, we don't have enough money to pay the mortgage now. It's, it's, uh, yeah, it can be a very depressing thing. So there is a darkness with music, you know, that, that all, that most of us face, you know, uh, you know, there's a few smashingly successful people. The rest of us, we have to deal with that reality that, you know, uh, the, the financial aspects always, always haunting all of us, you know, to try to make the, the numbers work so we can keep making music. That's what yeah. it's about. And you're a guy who, as you said in the beginning, you, you are aware of and even like the music business. I would imagine for people that, which is unusual for a musician because it's, you know, sort of different sides of the brain. Most people are not comfortable with it. They don't want to, they don't want to be aware of it. It's got to be for those folks, incredibly overwhelming. Yeah. It's ruined a lot of people. You know, yeah. a lot of good people have gotten trapped by drugs and booze because they couldn't, they couldn't handle the music business and the, the ups and downs and the heartaches and the, et cetera. Um, and it's so tedious, you know, you, you really have to, you have to be able to, to deal with it. And the younger artists, especially, I think they, they've grown up with it. Um, my generation, you know, one of the coolest things you could have was to say, I just worry about the music and my manager takes care of everything else. I, I, I show up and I'm told to do that. And that was someone to envy, you know, an artist that had that going was, that was an envious thing. Sure. But nowadays, most young artists, they realize that, wow, with all the social media and stuff, you've got to be plugged in all the time. You can't have somebody else doing it. Your fans expect you to be, you know, connected to them. It's an expectation now. So, you know, these artists nowadays, these young artists now, they're really hip. They're very savvy. Yeah. And they don't think like us older musicians did back then. They don't, they don't think that, oh, I'm just going to show up and play my music. That, they, they know you can't do that. Yeah. You, know, you, have, you have to be plugged in nowadays. It's an absolute necessity. You have to be. And that's tough, too, because it's, an, it's another skill set. And it's not just being plugged into social media. It's making sure you get gigs booked, uh, hiring musicians, getting an MD, or you being the MD, making sure the equipment. I mean, it's a, it's a lot of moving parts to manage. It's, it's a tough business, man. It is. There's, like you say, there's so many gigantic details that, you know, it is, you know, it, it does drive some people crazy. Yeah. Nice. Um, and, you know, it never did with me though. I, I, I sort of like dealing with it. I, I like, you know, I like sending a box of CDs to Amazon. <laughs> you know, that's fun. I, I like that's cool. It. Well, Hey man, to your credit, that's, that's awesome. Thanks for sharing that. And, um, um, you know, it's, you're, you're so prolific as a writer that had, I give you a lot of credit for that because when you're down, it's easy to say, man, I'm shutting off for a little while, but I don't get the sense. I get the sense you've always been this prolific as a writer all the time. Well, I'm certainly prolific in terms of I'm always going for something, you yeah. know, I'm always, I'm always working. Uh, during the, during this, uh, the, the COVID pandemic, uh, I talked to another artist. I won't say who it was. And um, he was saying, I just can't do anything. I, I, I can't write songs. Why bother? And I was like, why bother? <laughs> why bother? Well, because your fans want to hear your songs. That's why you bother. <laughs> yeah. you know? And just because, you know, they want to hear your songs more now, you know, if you don't want to record and spend money doing it, then, you know, put something on your Facebook page, you sing the song to them. And because yeah. your fans want to hear you, you know, yeah, you got to bother. What do you mean? What? You know, why bother? <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, that sounds like some, maybe just COVID's an excuse for, because yeah. that would, yeah, to be honest with you, I mean, I don't, no, no disrespect against whoever you're saying it, but you know, um, and we all have that at times, you know, but uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, we all have a life, why bother? But to say, yeah, to say that why bother musically speaking? Because if you're an artist, you have fans, obviously, you know, you may only have a few hundred fans, but you, that's a lot, <laughs> you know, yeah. compared to the guy that's that's managing the McDonald's, you know, you got a lot of folks that really care about you, you do, you know, um. Yeah, you know, what you're doing is important. So you know, yeah, but music, you're always, to... music always is, should be bothered with. You, you should always bother with music. I agree with you, especially nowadays, man. Nowadays, especially. Uh, yeah. uh, 
any, any, if you had to go back, is there any advice that you would have given yourself that would have made your life easier, either business or personal? Wow. You asked the best questions. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Thank you, man. Um, I, I wanted to say, I especially like the one where he said, what were the down times? Cause no one ever asked that. That's, that was really an astute question to ask. Thank you. Oh man. Thank you. Yeah. I'm, I, I could learn. And like, <laughs> right. well, I mean, and I'm, people learn from, I always want to know like when I'm, uh, it's like if I'm doing something in business and I'm like, what are the, mis what are the mistakes you make? Cause I want to not make them <laughs> right. right. If, if possible. Right. I would say, you know, for certain, I would tell the younger Jason to do lighten up a little bit, <laughs> you know, it's, lighten up, you know, the world's not going to end if this show that you're doing tonight is not the greatest show you've ever done. Cause that's the pressure I put on myself in the eighties. Um, and it was just nonsense, 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 nonsense. Uh, attitude to have. I went for it every single night. Um, and if I didn't get on that plateau in the performance, I would say it was a bad gig. And that's ridiculous because the people that were there didn't think that. Right. <laughs> you know? Maybe I thought that because I wasn't reaching some sort of nirvana point with with my performance for myself. But, you know, other people did. So, you know, Hey, you know, it's, it's cool. <laughs> you know, you yeah. don't, you don't have to be, you don't have to do the greatest show. I would say Jason, 23 years old, you know, I would say don't feel like you have to do the greatest show of your life every single night. That's impossible. That's, that's not possible. It is Give it your best every night yeah. and care every night, but don't think you've got to be, do your best show you've ever done every night. That's, that's not, that's not realistic. Um, the second thing I would say was, you know, enjoy the ride no matter where it goes, because, you know, even stars have disappointing experiences in the business, you know, so enjoy the ride wherever it goes, because what, you know, this is a tremendous privilege to be able to do this. It's, it's a wonderful thing. Yeah question for you thank you for sharing that that was really cool of you uh at what point did you realize that lightening up a bit like was there a trigger for you that happened or because that's a huge when you realize that i have found anyway it's like a million pound weight <laughs> gets lifted off you all of a sudden you know it, it it's like yeah, yeah do your best and care but don't be vested in the results. I think it's been a creeping thing over the years. Um, and I, I would have to say, to answer your question, it's been fairly recently, really, that I've, I've kind of taken that view of music that, you know, enjoy the ride yeah. first, foremost. And everything else kind of takes care of itself if you do that. Yeah. And I should correct that. I didn't mean don't be vested in the results. Don't be, don't have expectations. Yeah, right. Yeah, that's really right. what I meant to say. Right. You yeah, you, you know, you, you, you really can't have expectations <laughs> in music. You know, the only expectation you can have is enjoy playing music. You know, that, that you can expect and should. Yeah, and, and what you said, care about it and do your best. That's it, man. This you can't be responsible for the outcome all the time. Right. Um. You are, as I mentioned, you're such a prolific writer. Is there anybody that like specifically influenced you as a writer? Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, number one, number two, number three, number four, number five is Bob Dylan. Yeah. I'm a, I'm a Dylan. <laughs> yeah. No one else comes close Yeah. Uh, as a, as a writer, as a performer, as a personality, you know, everything about Bob Dylan captivated me hmm. um, growing up uh, when I was making my own music. Uh, now in the later stages of my life, Bob Dylan's always been there. Always been there. Always will. And as a writer, yeah, you, you can listen to my music and hear the Dylan. Oh, course. absolutely. Yeah. No <laughs> question. No question. Did you ever get to see him perform? Oh, golly. Yes, sir. Oh, that's um, cool. I'll tell you twice, uh, two different events. Uh, first, Dylan was one of the first real concerts I saw uh, in 79 or 80 when I was in college. 
And you know, I was born and raised in a hog farm in Illinois. There wasn't concerts, <laughs> you know. We had to drive, you know, the, 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 we didn't even know what concerts really were. <laughs> you know? It was that rural. Yeah. The closest we got was the Bureau County State Fair when they had these old country guys, you know. Um, so I never went to concerts growing up. So when I went oh. to college, then they had concerts. Yeah. And um, one of the first and best was Dylan. One of the first and very close to best was the Ramones. Um, oh. The same year that happened so dylan yeah dylan 79 yeah that was big but in 1989 we got asked to open for bob dylan on a tour <laughs> oh my god yeah we got to open for bob dylan now it was a bittersweet tour because it was the time when perry got sick the band was falling apart and we knew we were breaking up Mm. we knew we were going to lose our record deal and we we're going to, you know, the whole line of the eighties was coming to a close and we were going to break up. It was over. So we're doing this last tour with Bob Dylan. You know, I had this all access pass, you know, I could go anywhere in the venue and watch Bob Dylan work every night for like two and a half weeks. So one night I might stand by the soundboard if you're Bob Dylan. Not a night I might, pick a seat that hadn't been taken at the top. Another night I might uh, stand right off stage at the backstage, you know, and take a folding chair and watch him from the backstage. Um, you know, another night I might go right down front. If there was a VIP spot that hadn't been taken, I could take that, you know. And uh, I would watch him every night do his shows. He was doing good shows then. He had G.E. Smith on guitar, oh. you know, a really good rhythm section. He was playing a lot of piano at the time. Uh, it was the Oh Mercy record tour. It, those songs are really good on that record. Did you, you meet know. him? You didn't get to meet him, though. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, you did? Oh, yeah. We um, we had been told that if he has his hood up, don't bother him. He, he always wears <laughs> hoodies. If he has this his hood like up, you don't bother Bob Dylan. Bob Dylan <laughs> secret code language. Yeah, that was the code. Um, he had a bodyguard, but he was really cool about it. They weren't like like thug kind of bodyguards they were like you know respectful and because oh my gosh dylan even by 1989 was still getting these people who you know wanted them to tell them the secret of life you know <laughs> oh, yeah. you know and all these people with psychological problems that were going to bob dylan to be safe um <laughs> so he had bodyguards he had two bodyguards with him but i found him to be rather open and you know i'd heard all these stories that bob dylan you know i'd read the biography where he tore Phil Oaks apart, you know, and Oaks almost had a nervous breakdown over it. I'd heard these stories of Dylan going psychotic on people, you know, uh, psychologically, you know, just tearing them apart. And I'd seen the interviews, you know, on yeah. public interviews where he would just make fun of these journalists and stuff, you know, the sarcasm and you know, borderline mean, really. Yeah. Um, so I was bound and determined. I was not going to ask Bob Dylan why he wrote all along the watchtower. <laughs> you know, I wasn't going to ask, you know, what's the meaning of, you know, uh, you know, of John Wesley Harden. I wasn't going to ask these questions. You know, I was just going to like be cool. And if Bob Dylan wanted to talk, I would talk. And it did happen, you know, like there we, I'd be, you know, at the, at the, uh, uh, hospitality table having our catered dinner and you know you'd go and scoop out your barbecue and your potato salad and then I'm spook you know scooping out barbecue and then right next to me I hear somebody say hey man the barbecue looks really good tonight <laughs> and he still <laughs> you know? and he said yeah man the food looks really good tonight this is really cool and yeah and I was like yeah Bob yeah the barbecue looks really good yeah, I think I'll get some potato salad, too. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> so you were like 15 years old right then, right? Yeah, oh, yeah. The yeah. potato salad. Yeah, get the potato salad. Yeah, that's good. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know? And then, you know, it'd just be these weird little experiences. But the weirdest, hands down, and Andy York will vouch for this, you know, who was our second guitar player at the time. Now is Mellencamp's guitar player. He'd, he'd, he'd be a good uh, a person for your for your show if you ever wanted him. Yeah. But Andy York and me were walking down the hall and we were going past the room and the door sort of cracked and he goes, Hey fellas, fellas, come on in. 
<laughs> and me and Andy look at each other and say, that sounds like Dylan, but we don't see him. And yeah, come on in, man. And so we sort of like push this little door and there's Bob Dylan in his dressing room. And me and Andy, you know, Andy is another Dylan, uh, Dylan head as well. So we're sort of standing there like, I feel really awkward, <laughs> you know, like I really shouldn't be here. You know, even though Bob Dylan invited me into his dressing room, I just feel weird. And then, you know, I was sort of having a, a pre-show drink, you know, he, he, he liked, he, he wasn't abusive, but he, you know, he, I could tell that he, he liked to have a drink before the show. And he was sort of having a little drink and uh, whiskey and Coke, I guess, and um, Coca-Cola, I mean. And um, <laughs> um, you qualified the Coke for the period of time. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> that right. was good. <laughs> but and then Bob Dylan starts to get dressed. That's creepy. <laughs> and me and Andy were, were, were just like, neither one of us knew what, do we like leave now? Or, or do we talk to him? Or, or do you know, like, hold your hand like, here so you can't see and, anything. <laughs> yeah, it was, you know, it was the most surreal experience of my entire life, you know. Um, that's so dressed. funny. And then he kept talking, you know, he kept like, and he was on this thing about sometimes you don't need drummers, you know, and he was talking about like, cause we, our Perry was sick at that point. We didn't have a drummer. We'd gone on the tour acoustically and Dylan gave us some, like, he, I don't know. He said something nice about, Hey, I like you, how you're doing your set now, you know? <laughs> and yeah, sometimes drums take up so much frequency, you know, they, they, they soak up so much frequency. You got to sing over the drums and, Sometimes better just not to have drums. And we were like, well, okay, Bob, yeah, great, you know. <laughs> yeah, I agree, you know, whatever you say, yeah. Um, and then finally, you know, we had to go do our show, and, you know, and then we saw Bob on stage later, and we thought, oh, wow, the outfit he's wearing, I saw him put on. This is profoundly disturbing. Yeah. <laughs> that is disturbing, man. That's hilarious. Yeah, that's hilarious, man. And there's some people that are like just socially a little weird like that. Like, let me get dressed in front of somebody. And you always wonder, like, are you not aware that this is a little weird? Right. It's like, <laughs> that's going through your head, but you can't really say that. Like, Hey man, this, you know, I, maybe now you can, you know, but uh, yeah, you, I don't know if you could say that to Bob. Don't, hey Bob, isn't it a little weird that you're getting, yeah, that's pretty funny, man. Great story. <laughs> um, what's your favorite song you wrote? Oh, my favorite song. Wow. Yeah. Good question. Um, I don't think I can narrow it down to one, but I can, I can kind of narrow it down to periods. Uh, 80 Scorpions would be Harvest Moon. Um, the 2000s run of Jason Ringenberg probably would be John the Baptist was a real humdinger. Oh, very cool. Um, the Farmer Jason trip would probably be punk rock skunk <laughs> although the tractor goes chug 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 is pretty close second punk rock skunk that's a cool name what's the first record you ever bought if you remember i think it was uh johnny horton's greatest hits johnny horton was a a country singer from the late 50s early 60s he had smash hits huge gigantic hits uh Battle of New Orleans, Sink the Bismarck, uh, songs like that. But he was different from all the other country singers. He was, his production was, dang, almost Beatles or Beach Boys X. It was, for country music, it was just yeah. out there, crazy, crazy cool. Uh, and I bought it on 8-track, I bought it on 8-track. How did you get, so let me ask you this, how did that, how did that vibe that I want to play country music and the Ramones where did that come from it was in my college years I would have been 20 or 21 seeing the Ramones certainly changed it my younger brother was actually a first wave punk rocker he was into punk rock okay uh, so he was playing the Sex Pistols on 8 track and stuff and um and the Ramones and Bowie and all those kind of crazy people in Sheffield Illinois we all thought he was crazy but that was my first exposure. 
but it was in college. It wasn't the Scorchers, actually, that was the first band that I played with that were doing the sort of eighth note punk rock rhythms to country music. Uh, it was a band called Shakespeare's Riot that I was in in 1980 and 81 and uh, in Carbondale, Illinois. And we were doing it. We were taking Hank Senior songs and we were putting them to an eighth note rhythm. And the people hated it that we were playing for. <laughs> you know, we were playing these sort of college cover bars, you know, um, and they couldn't even do Hank Williams, let alone Hank Williams done yeah. with eighth notes. They, it was, it was, it was ugly. <laughs> it was brutally, the, the, you know, he got thrown back at us all the time, but I, I kept sort of with the idea. And of course with the scorchers and it was just natural, you know, it was a, we didn't, I didn't have to explain it to those guys. They just did it. You know, they, they got it. I mean, Jeff, that's how he played. He played like Didi Ramon, you know, Warner had, you know, he was equal parts, you know, Angus Young, James Burton, Albert Lee, That's you know, Jimmy, Jimmy Hendrick, yeah. you know, uh, Johnny Ramone with, with the great country pickers. So it, they were, they were, just, they just did it. it. There was never a discussion with Jason and Scorchers. It was perfected and we never talked about it. I don't remember ever talking about it. Like, Fellas, if we take this Hank Senior song and wonder you put this feedback to it and Jeff did the eighth notes, it was nothing like that. It was just, okay, I'm a Rolling Stone, and then they would just kick in and do it. Yeah, you know? uh, they would just do it. It was like, okay, I'm gonna do here's uh, NG, fellas. Uh, well, yo, railroad gate, you know, I just can't jump it. And then all of a sudden, one of you playing this, ram to bam bam ram to bam bam Jeff would be going, right on, 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 It was just, like, natural. It was just, like, by the second verse, you know, we had that version of Absolutely Sweet Marie without even talking about it. You know, they just did it. Lost Highway, that all that great, you know, that, that weird uh, modulation you know, we were playing it in the A with eighth notes, which already revolutionized the song. Originally, it was, let me just play it. It was, yeah, originally, um, it was originally, wow, that sounds really out of tune. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's try a So we would play, you know, Hank would play it. I'm a rolling stone, all alone in the low. So I just did it to the Scorchers, you know, and I, I just started playing it. Uh, fellas, try this in A. I didn't even tell them who wrote it. I didn't tell them nothing. I said, here's a song that, you know, I didn't even say much. I don't think I even said anything. I just said, uh, try this in A, fellas. I'm a rolling stone, all alone in the lost, for a lot of sin. By the time I heard the word sin, Jeff was already just like going, Warner was doing this, I can't even play it. It was just super distorted, sort of, you know, and Perry was doing that pop, 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 pop thing, you know, that he did, that sort of, uh, you know, amphetamine Charlie Watts thing he did. <laughs> so we did it, you know, all the way through the first verse, you know, then into the second verse, I was just a lad, and then we got to the harp solo, then we didn't even think about it. I said, oh, harmonica, yeah. So I grabbed my A harmonica, my D harmonica for the key of A and started playing it, you know. And, you know, I just kicked it into another level. All of a sudden, you know, there's no vocal singing. It's just me rocking out on the harmonica with Warner and Jeff and Perry just, just killing it. This is the first time through, all right? So we got into, we got into that through that solo um, and the natural thing to do after the harp solo the country thing to do and the the normal musicality thing to do would be you know you're doing uh you know da -da 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 -da. Go 
Those are so hard to go there. That's the thing that most people would do. All right. right. Country bands and rock bands, punk rock bands would have all gone to the be there. I don't know how they did this. Warner gave Jeff a nod and he gave like this down thing with his head. And Jeff and Warner, precisely at the same time, went from A. Instead of going to B, they went Warner nodded down and they went down to F sharp. Not F sharp minor. That might have made some sense because that's a related chord to A. F sharp major. <laughs> you know? So they're doing this weird thing, all sort of without talking about it, all without thinking about it, all without, all just, just by spur of the moment, in the moment thing. They went to F sharp, and right off the bat, you know, Jeff was just laying eights at that point. He was just laying eights. And Perry went to the floor tom, and Warner started doing that crazy, I can't even sing it, let alone play it. It was just right. so weird. And instead of, you know, this lift to be, this really did sound like Satan was chasing us, you know? It really did sound like we were headed for hell, you know? Like we really were on the Lost Highway, you know? And he was doing that round, Oh, wow. So I started just singing it. Now, boys, don't start to run around on this road of sin. You'll be sorrow bound. Wow. You know, against that, 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 that arpeggio chord one was doing that hammer on thing. Oh, wow. Perry then, right off the, right off the bat, just started doing a fifth harmony on it. That thing that only Perry Bass can do. Um, so, you know, we just on the spot hit that thing in F sharp major, you know, and then, you know, again, without thinking about it, without talking about it, how do you end it? You know, we weren't even asking ourselves a question. You know, we were just on this road of sin, you'll be sorrow bound. The guys held it twice as long. I was on start way up there today. We saw the road is down. Then, Jeff, then Warner gave Jeff another nod down. Instead of going up, they went down again. This lost highway. They went down to the E off the F sharp, um, just instinctively did that. We had it right from the start. We, we completely revolutionized the song Lost Highway from a very, very sad country song about, you know, drinking too much beer in the tavern to this really scary song about losing your damn soul. <laughs> you know? what, what year was this? <laughs> you know, what, what it was a was heavy that? moment, and we knew it right from the start. And we, we ended up opening with that song all through the 80s. We could never find a better opening song than Lost Highway. It was always the opener. It was just perfect. What, you know? When did you first do this together? What year? That would have been the fall of 1981. You know, man, that is so – so that's like 40 years ago almost. That Your enthusiasm – and your recall of each of those moments is really says a lot about where that, what that whole event stands in your life. You know, that level of enthusiasm 40 years later, that's really cool to be listening to from my perspective, man. Well, to create something new is not something that happens too often in life. You know, yeah. we knew it. We knew at that moment that, wow, this is really good. Yes. <laughs> you know, this is okay. We just kind of stopped and nobody kind of said anything, you know, we just kind of like, Oh, and then I think Warner said some, something profane, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, you know, and we just knew it, you know, that's right. Really I can cool, look man. at Jeff in those days and well, like we look each other in the eye and it was like, yeah, this is, this is something special. Um, so that's how it was. And, and almost all the great stuff the Scorpers did in those days was, was done that way. We never really rehearsed. We weren't a rehearsal band. We, um, we would just kind of 
play, <laughs> you know, we would just kind of, and we, we didn't really believe in, in hitting the stuff too hard. It was all, it was all just, let's not talk about this, you know, we just do it, you know. Um, we had it, you know. I won't say Jason and the Scorters were the first cow punk band because there's people that will debate that. You know, somebody will say some obscure band from 1979 or, or whatever. You know, and I'll say, of course, Shakespeare's Riot was one of the first, I would say. You yeah, know, your first. other band, yeah. But the Scorchers defined it, you know. We defined that sort of genre with those songs, Lost Highway and Absolutely Sweet Marine, the early originals. Uh, I think we can lay claim to that. Um <sighs> It, there was something about it that was just in our blood. It was, I, I can't imagine a better band to sort of do that with than those four guys. And people said I was crazy, you know, because, you know, Jeff and Perry and Warner, uh, Jeff and Perry and Warner in those days had serious problems, you know, serious substance abuse issues. And yeah. um, it was crazy, you know, and it was, these guys were not average sort of dudes that you'd hang out with and grill a burger with. These guys, they, they were half crazy, you know, yeah. <laughs> easily half crazy, not always in a good way. And people would say, man, dump those guys. They're, 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 they're just, they're, you know, they're just too crazy to, to really do this with what you're trying to do. But I never gave up on the idea that I knew that those four people had something special. And I was willing to go through the bad times to get to the good times. Because when we hit the good show, there was nothing like it. it was, yeah. uh, there was nothing in my life that I'd ever experienced to that level when the Scorpions would hit a groove in those shows in 83, 84, 85, especially. There yeah. was something spectacularly special about it. And, and I'll, I'll never forget and always be very thankful and very feel very blessed that I got to experience that with, with people, you know, with, with other human beings, something that was way bigger than me. You know, it, yeah. wasn't, it wasn't my trip. It was a bigger, way bigger than that. And golly, I loved it. Man. Uh, I'm just going to ask you a couple more questions if you're okay with that. You're, you're, this is a good ending point, but I just want to ask a couple more if you're okay uh, with All it. Right. Um, thank you. That was really cool. That whole thing, man. That was really, really cool to share that. You're very, um, very well. Toughest decision you had to make. Um, well, the toughest decisions always are when you got to let somebody go. Yeah. I never got used to that. Nobody likes doing that. And I've had to do it in music experiences uh you know in two of my three personas i've had to let people go and it's no fun it's a horrible experience yeah and last question jason and tell me over the last 10 years what's been the biggest change in your personality and has that change been intentional or is a natural part of aging i think it's what we talked about earlier i, I definitely have changed into a super driven got to get everything done today and got to make everything work and got to, you know, got to do this and got to sell that and got to, you know, do this thing you know, to, Hey man, just have fun. Yeah. <laughs> That's the biggest change. Yeah. And that is a great way to end this. Thank you, man. Uh, let me tell, t talk about, you have, uh, first of all, let me tell people where to find you. Uh, Jason's got a pretty robust website. It's Jason Ringerberg. Let me spell it for Ringenberg. Sorry. R I N G E N B E R G. So it's Jason Ringenberg.com. And on Facebook, he's at Jason Ringenberg Music. Talk about you have a new record coming out as a crowdfunding project. And I'd like to send people over there to fund it. Where do we where do they go and talk about the record? Oh, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. Yeah, I'm doing a new solo record um, during this pandemic. You know, what do guys like me do? Well, we write songs and make records. <laughs> yeah, man, absolutely. I wrote songs, made a record. Some of them I had written at Sequoia. Some of them uh, are, are brand new. And it's called Rhinestoned. Rhinestoned, that's the name of the record. 
was recorded here in Nashville with George Bradview using social distancing methods. <laughs> we were able to do that. Yeah. You, um, you know that, you know, like if you didn't say that, somebody somewhere would say, I hope he's, I hope he, like, like the point of things are often missed. I don't get this now. Like, <laughs> right. sorry, I don't mean to go on. It's like, thank you for saying that. Cause some idiot would have fucked it up anyway. <laughs> yeah. Well, and George, luckily George can play about anything. So it was easy to do. Good. Um, so right now, then we are, when this, when this starts airing, we are, uh, either the record is coming out you can check it out. Uh, it'll be out in, you know, hopefully in March of early March of 2021. Uh, but uh, we're going to be doing a crowdfunding program for it so we can, you know, raise money to, to get it out properly and promote it properly. And that's going to be on Indiegogo and you can check that out. You know, uh, we'll be, you know, we'll have links and things on the Facebook and, and on, on the websites as to how you can buy cool stuff that I have for sale, or you can have Jason Ringenberg do a concert for you and you pick the songs and all kinds oh, of cool, cool. stuff. It's going to be a great, a great uh, program. Okay, so to do that, and I would really encourage everybody to support Jason's music, go to Indiegogo.com and look up Jason Ringenberg. Again, it's R-I-N-G-E-N-B-E-R-G, or also go to his website at JasonRingenberg.com and Facebook at Jason Ringenberg Music, and pay attention to, um, do you have an email? You probably have an opt-in on your website or something like that. Yeah, there's ways to get a hold of me. Yeah, no Great. problem. Great. Just okay. opt-in, and then you know, you'll be on his list and uh, support the record when it comes out. Anything else you want to promote, man? Uh, that's pretty much it right now. You know, uh, I will say that this was, you know, I'm a press guy, so I've done a lot of interviews <laughs> in my, oh, in my 40 year career. This may be one of my favorites. I've oh ever man. I, I thoroughly enjoyed this. It was great fun. Great oh fun. man. Thank you. I'm like uh, getting goosebumps now. I don't, I'm, I'm working on taking compliments. That's what I'm doing. I'm work- Thank you very much. I can see, I can see why you've had so many incredible people on this program. Gee, oh. Wow, I, I can see why, you know, and thank you. You know, like Warner doesn't really like press and interviews and things, and he was he he actually told me you got to do this one. You got to do this one. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. That's really kind of you to tell me that. Thanks so much, Jason. Um, man, uh, when your new record comes out, come back on the show. We'll promote it. I'd love to do that. All right, please Excellent. don't don't be uh, don't hesitate. Um, Listen, thank you very much for everything. I appreciate it. Hang on one second and we'll wrap up. Everybody, thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this, please share it on your social media channels. We appreciate your support. Is it true that there's a box set of Farmer Jason coming out? <laughs> I don't think kids can sit through a whole box set. They lose their patience after a while. <laughs> Uh, thanks very much to Jason Ringenberg for spending time with us. Again, uh, check out the new record that's being uh, worked on right now on Indiegogo.com or else go to JasonRingenberg.com or Jason Ringenberg Music and support uh, Jason's music and what he's doing. And uh, most important, man, especially nowadays, remember that happiness really is a choice. So choose wisely. Be nice. Go play your guitar and have fun. Till next time, peace and love, everybody. I'm out. Brother, thank you so much, Jason.